Hey guys, what's up? In this video, I am going to be doing a complete from start to finish guide showing you how to install Linux Ubuntu 19.04 in order to get the best possible performance and visual standards out of your Intel, AMD and Nvidia GPUs using both CMU and Yuzu emulator. While this guide is specifically made to show all of you guys how to get better performance and visuals out of those emulators, you can also use it as a basic installation tutorial for just getting this operating system set up itself. Everything, as I said, is going to be shown and clearly displayed. Now before we get things started, there are a few requirements and a few things you're already going to want to have set up. For one, you're already going to need both CMU and Yuzu emulators already set up on your PCs. You'll find my full and complete installation tutorials for those in the description of this video, that is, if you don't already have them set up and configured on Windows. We are doing this mostly because it is a bit of a pain to download games, updates, DLCs and set up all of your game paths on Ubuntu, so for this purpose we are going to be required to set it up on Windows first. In relation to the installation of Ubuntu 19.04, you are going to be required to have a USB of at least 2GB, however I would recommend using 4GB or over, in my case I'm going to be using a 16GB USB stick I had laying around. You are also going to be required to have system storage available to you, for this guide I am going to be recommending having at least 50GB of storage free, but you can make do with 30GB, and again, for my use case, I'm going to be installing this on a separate SSD which I also had laying around, this is by far the best method for installing installation, installing it on a separate, free, clean drive. Once you're happy that you meet all of these recommended specs and settings, we can get this guide started. Okay, so before we get started, there are some things you're going to need to download to make things really, really easy on yourself for this install. You'll find these three text documents linked in downloadable form in this video's description. These documents are going to give you copy pasteable terminal commands for use in Linux to make this as easy as I can possibly make it. You're also going to need to download Rufus 3.5 and also your Ubuntu 19.04 ISO file. You'll find a link for all of this stuff down in the description for the ISO you simply click this download button and it will give you exactly this file. Next, you need to put your 8 or 16 gigabyte USB drive into your PC and run Rufus. Once you run it, you should see your drive appear like so, then you need to select your ISO or disk image, we're simply going to click select and then select our Ubuntu 19.04 ISO. Next, you want to make sure this is set to GPT, and once you have this set, there's pretty much nothing else we need to change here. While you can change some of these names, you don't really need to change any more of these file systems, you can change this volume name if you want, but for now, we're just going to be clicking this start button since we are ready. Once you click start, you want to write this in DD image mode. This is not the recommended to use, but I have found it to be the most compatible mode. Click OK, and you can go through this warning, it's going to tell you it's going to format your disk and delete all its data, and then it's going to begin writing this Ubuntu install image to this USB drive. Once it's finished, you can pretty much click the X button and close Rufus as our USB is now ready for use. Before we do anything though, we need to come to our disk management and actually free up some storage space if you're going to be using an existing drive in your computer in order to install Ubuntu. Now you can see I have these two drives right here. If you only have one drive on your computer, you're going to be doing the exact same thing. We're going to be shrinking a volume in order to make some space on one of these drives on which to install Ubuntu. All you need to do is right click whichever drive you wish to shrink and make space on, then once this window pops up into this highlighted field, you need to enter the amount you're going to shrink it by. For this use case in this video, I'm going to select 50,000, that means 50 gigabytes or there or thereabouts. However, if you have a limited disk space, you can probably get away with 30,000 for the purposes of this guide. I myself, I'm going to set this to 50,000, but as I said, if you only want to set it to 30,000, you can set it to 30,000. Once you hit the shrink button, it should show up like so as unallocated space. When we're installing Linux, this is going to show up as free space on which you're going to be able to install the operating system. Personally, I'm going to be installing this on a faster, separate SSD, and I will also highly recommend each and every one of you to do the same thing. However, if you do not have one available, you can shrink the drive like so. Next, simply right click your Windows icon, restart, and we're going to begin installation. Once you restart your computer, you're going to be hitting the delete or the F1 key on your computer, then heading to the boot section. In this boot section, you need to make sure that you select the Ubuntu disk we have just previously made, and once you select it as a boot device, you need to select install Ubuntu by using your arrow keys and then hitting enter. 
Once you proceed through all of these stages, you should be met with this welcome window where you're going to be selecting whatever language you want to install. Hit continue, then select your keyboard layout. For my use case, it's English UK since I use a UK extended keyboard. And once we continue, this is one of the first important screens we're going to be changing. You want to make sure to download updates while installing Ubuntu, and you also want to select install third-party software for graphics, Wi-Fi hardware, and additional media formats. Once you have all of this selected, once again, and hit continue. For this stage of installation, it can actually take quite a few minutes to get everything set up, so please just be patient and wait for it to load. And there we go, we're onto our next screen. The next thing we need to do is select this something else option at the bottom of this window instead of selecting any of these other options. Again, select something else, then you can simply click the continue button in the bottom right hand corner again. Again, this can take a few minutes to proceed through to this screen, so please just be patient. As you can see on my PC, since I have four drives connected, all of my drives are showing up. This area of free space is the 50,000 megabytes we freed up in our Windows operating system. Now before I go too much further, I also want to explain some installation steps you're going to need to make in the event that you are installing this on the same drive on which your Windows OS is installed. So the setup is pretty much the exact same, however, if you were installing this on the exact same drive that Windows operating system is installed on, you are only going to need to make three different directory partitions instead of the four you're going to see me make for my separate drive in just a moment. So basically, if you're installing on the same drive as Windows, you're going to be setting up your drives as follows with the forward slash, swap and home directories. Then if you're installing on a separate drive away from your Windows operating system, you're going to be using EFI, forward slash, swap and home. Home. Again, as I said, you're going to be making these different partitions on the free space or free storage which we freed up within Windows by shrinking our drive. I just want to make 100% sure that if you are installing on the same drive as your Windows operating system, you make sure not to make an EFI partition on that drive. Okay, so as I said, I am going to be installing my version of Linux on this free SSD. In order to make these different partitions, there are two different ways. You can either right click and select add on the free space simply click add you will see this size area here this is all of the available storage on your selected disk this is where you want to put all of the different values which i previously specified as i said if you're installing on a separate drive 1000 for your efi partition click ok and when you scroll back down through your drives you should see this efi partition now available as i've stressed already if you are using the same drive which your windows operating system is installed on you 100 do not need or want to make this efi partition partition, so just skip this part. Next, we're going to be making our second, or I guess your first partition if you are using the same disk as your Windows operating system. As I previously specified, you're going to be setting this to 10,000 this time instead of 1,000, and then you're going to make sure you're using the ext4 journaling file system. Once you have this selected, you want to select your mount point, select forward slash, and once you have all of these different options and storage spaces selected, click OK. Once I scroll down, I should see this green tick arrow. Next, select your free space again, hit the plus arrow again, and now we're going to be setting up our swap file. So for our swap file, we're going to be setting this to 12,000 megabytes. This swap file is basically going to be doing the exact same thing as a virtual memory or a paging file. Once you have the file size selected, come to use as, select swap area, and once you have everything as shown, click OK. And there we go, we have now created our swap file. The final directory we need to make is our home directory. Again, select your free space, hit the plus or right click and select add, and then we are going to be using the remainder of our storage space in order to use as our home directory. Now, if you created your 30,000 or 50,000 megabytes of free space, you're going to have a lot less than this, but since I am using a separate SSD, I'm just going to be using the remaining space. Once again, select forward slash home and use the ext4 journaling file system and click OK. Once you come back to your partitions, you should now see that your ext4 and home directories are selected with these green tick boxes. However, before you do anything, you need to make 100% sure that your bootloader is stored on the correct drive. 
for my use case, since I'm installing on this SSD, I'm going to be selecting the SSD itself from this drop down list. You need to make 100% sure that you do not accidentally override your Windows boot manager. For my use case, I'll be putting it on this drive and area right here, selecting this option. But if you're using any other different drives, please make sure to select the actual drive. And as I said, make 100% sure that you don't put it on the same area as your Windows boot manager. So now that you've correctly selected your bootloader installation area, set up all your partitions, you are now ready to click the install and now button and begin the installation process of Ubuntu 19.04. This window is just telling you that any of the data on your disk is going to be overwritten. Next, select whatever region or area you are in and then you're going to need to enter your username, your computer's name and select your password. In Ubuntu 19.04, if you enter your username, it's just going to auto select these. For my use case, I only use Ubuntu for certain programs, so I'm just going to use a single keystroke as my password. And there we go, it's going to begin copying files and installing itself. Again, as with some of the previous steps, this stage can take quite a large amount of time. Once installation is complete, this message will pop up. You simply click restart now, and once you've selected restart now, this indication should pop up, which tells you to remove your installation medium, so your USB storage disk, and then hit enter. Once you hit enter and reboot, this grub window should pop up. If you want to continue to Windows, select Windows Boot Manager, but for Ubuntu, simply select Ubuntu. And there we go, we have now successfully and properly installed Ubuntu 19.04. In the event that this software updater window pops up, please just click install now to make sure that you download and install all of the latest software updates. Okay, so now that that's done, we're going to be mounting and making sure that all of your Windows drives auto mount when you launch into Linux or Ubuntu. All you want to do is click down here and into this search field, you want to enter the word disk. Next, open this disk manager and when this window opens right here, you can see these are all the drives connected to this computer. We're now going to be setting these to auto mount at a system startup. What you want to do is select the drive, select this cogwheel icon, deselect user session defaults and make sure this is set to mount at a system startup. This is going to ask you for your user password, simply enter it and for all of the remaining drives and their largest storage areas, you need to do the exact same thing, making sure that each and every one of these is going to mount at system startup. Doing this is absolutely integral for the ease of use and access to any and all of the files on any of your Windows drives, so please make sure you correctly do this before you configure any of the additional settings. While we have now set them to auto mount at startup, since we have not restarted our computer, Computer, they are not going to be mounted so we are going to need to manually mount them just this once. Before we do that, I'm going to show you how you can grab those tutorial documents which I made you download at the start of this video. You're going to want to come to your operating system SSD, you're going to want to come to the user directory, your own username directory and once here you're going to be looking for the desktop directory. Once here you should see any and all of these TXT documents which I previously provided to you. All you want to do is highlight them like so, then simply right click and select copy. Next, on our desktop in Ubuntu, we're going to be creating a new folder, simply right click, select new folder and make a new folder titled guides. Once you have this folder made, simply navigate to inside of it and click paste. You now have access to all of these text documents within Ubuntu, but before we can use them, we are going to need to make sure that all of these drives are mounted. To mount them manually, all you have to do is double click them and enter into their file and folder directories. Once you come back and see that all of these little mounted icons are present in the right hand side of this field, this means that these drives are already mounted. You won't ever need to do this again as as we have already set these drives to auto mount upon a system restart. Now that we have all of that set up, we can begin the installation and download process of CMU Emulator. As I stated at the start of this video, I'm also going to be showing you how to download the correct GPU drivers. Everything required will be timestamped in the video's description. For now, you want to open this CMU on Ubuntu with Wine text document. As you can see, everything is easily and simply laid out here. All you need to do is follow exactly what I show on screen and it is going to work for you absolutely perfectly. 
To open a terminal, all you have to do is right click on your desktop, select open in a terminal, and then simply copy and paste each of these terminal commands following the instructions that come after each and every one of them. If it asks you for your password, simply enter your password and hit enter. As I said, it really is as simple as entering all of the terminal commands and following exactly what it asks you to do on screen. Please make sure that you enter every single command one after the other. This is going to be installing Wine for you, a program that is required to run a CMU emulator on Ubuntu. Once you've done everything I've shown, we're going to be setting up Wine with this installation and configuring command. So as I said, once you have everything set up, you simply want to enter into this same terminal, Wine CFG, simply copy and paste this right here. This is going to run the configurator for Wine. You should see this Wine configuration window pop up. Let's just drag it down here for a little bit more clarity. Next, as the guide says, you want to set your Windows version to Windows 10, then click the apply button. Next, you're going to want to be adding all of these new overrides for library. Simply come to this library section and then with each and every one of these options right here, you simply want to copy and paste it into this field here, click paste and then click add. Again, you want to do this for every single one of these. When you enter a DBG help, it should give you this little pop-up window. Simply select yes and continue to input every single one of these new overrides for library. Again, as before, once you have entered all of these, click the apply button. Next, as we've done all the way along, we're going to be continuing with the guide. We need to come to the drives window and make sure to click auto detect. Now for this section to work you need to 100% make sure that all of your drives are already mounted as we previously did in the video. They are going to show up something similar like so C, D, E, F, G and H. As you can see mine are all correctly showing up. You 100% need to make sure that these are detected like so in order to have access to your CMU files on your Windows installation. Again as before hit the apply button and we are now basically done with our Wine configuration. Simply click the OK button to make this window close. Next, we need to install some more dependencies in order to get all of these applications and see me running. Simply, as before, continue through and enter all of these different terminal commands and follow exactly what it says on screen. Next up, we're going to be actually downloading, extracting and installing CMU its graphics packs, its shared fonts, and CMU hook itself. As we've done before, all you need to do is copy and paste the command into a terminal, hit enter, and it's going to begin downloading a CMU, CMU hook, your graphics packs, and your shared fonts. Now, in the event that you are using an NVIDIA GPU, it is likely to get stuck at this stage right here, downloading a CMU hook shared fonts. If this does happen, all you need to do is come to the end of this command and add dash F, then simply copy, paste and run this command in a terminal once again. As before, this is going to download CMU, CMU hook, your shared fonts, your graphics packs and absolutely everything required to run this emulator on Ubuntu. To locate where everything was downloaded and installed to, you simply open your home folder and then at the top section right here you need to show hidden files. Once you do this, it should show this .cmu folder and when you navigate to inside of this folder, right here are all of your CMU files for running the emulator. Next, you need to right click this window click open in terminal and as you can see this has made this directory my terminal target. For AMD GPU users you want to make sure to run using this terminal command here but since right now I have my Nvidia GPU in my computer I'm going to be using this command for Nvidia. All I want to do is right click again select copy and paste this into this window. Once I have entered this command and hit enter, it should boot and run CMU. It is most likely going to look like this when you boot it for the very first time with the window blacked out. But as you can see, this is the latest version at time of making this video 1.15.6. Next, you need to come to your general settings in option and set up your MLC paths. Now, if you set up your drives exactly as I've shown you how to configure them, when you come to my computer, they should all be showing up like so. Next, you need to navigate to the place that your MLC01 backup is located on your Windows PC. There are my games, I can use that for the next step, but for now, I'm looking for this CMU emulator backup folder. If you followed my Windows installation guide for CMU Emulator, this is exactly where your MLC folder and all of your game updates and DLCs should be installed. Next, you need to add a game path. 
Again, come back to my computer and find where your Wii U games folder is. Again, you should have all of this set up from your Windows installation of CMU Emulator. Once you have this done, you can simply close this general settings window, and once the UI updates, you should now see that you have all of your games accessible on a Linux Ubuntu, and you also have them fully updated with their DLC added. Next, all you need to do is set up your game profile settings for your games. In my use case, I'm going to be using a triple core recompiler since I have a 6 core CPU. I'm going to set threaded quantum to 100,000, and when I come across to the graphics tab, I want to set this to minimal for Nvidia GPUs and GPU buffer cache accuracy of low. Again, any and all of these setup steps can be found in my full setup guide for the latest version of CMU Emulator. And again, for this Linux installation, if you want to be updated to the latest version of CMU, all you need to do is download it from the CMU website and replace the CMU.exe in this .CMU folder. For now, I'm going to be restarting my PC, replacing my 1080 Ti with my RX 580, and showing you guys exactly how you can download and install the latest MESA driver, the correct driver which you need to use for Ubuntu with CMU. Okay, so now that we've rebooted into the operating system, you can select this option from the top right hand corner, come down to this details tab, and this will show you exactly what GPU you're using. You can see I'm using a Radeon RX 580. Next, all you want to do is open your guides section again and open the ubuntu driver install.txt. Again, all you have to do is follow exactly what is laid out in this text document, simply open a terminal and paste each and every one of these commands concurrently as shown. Again, all you have to do is continue following the text document. Once you have run all of these terminal commands, you simply come down to your bottom left hand corner and you're going to be searching for the software updater. If it doesn't show on screen, simply enter into this field, software, and this software updater should display on screen. When this pops up, it should download any and all updates required to get everything you just installed working. As you can see, there is quite a lot, so all you want to do is click the install and now button, then wait for absolutely everything here to download and install. Once everything has finished downloading and installing, simply click OK, then you're going to be required to restart your computer again. So once you have the correct driver installed, you will once again want to come back to your guides folder and back to your CMU on Ubuntu guide. Let's just minimize this window to make everything a little bit more clear. Again, you want to come back to your .CMU folder and again right click here and select open in terminal. Once your terminal is open, you want to scroll down your list to this 4AMD GPU terminal command. Again, all you want to do is highlight all of this text right click it, select copy, and then paste this into terminal. As before, with the NVIDIA command we use to launch CMU emulator, this is going to launch CMU with the best possible compatibility settings for your AMD GPU. As with the Windows installation of CMU emulator, you are required to turn on specific graphics packs and map all of your controller inputs. The most important packs by far are the graphics, mods, and workaround graphics packs in this area. As always, you're going to want to be turning on FPS++, making sure you're using the performance fence. You're also going to want to be making sure that under a dynamic game speed, you're using 32 frames averaged. Again, you can also select your FPS cap, which I myself usually set to 72, but for the purposes of this guide, I'm going to set to 60. And again, for the purposes of this guide, you're also going to want to turn on this NPC stutter effects in the event that you have stuttery NPCs or enemies not moving in the game world. Next, we're also going to be turning on a 1080p resolution graphics pack. We're going to be turning on shadow resolution, but I'm going to leave it at the 1x medium preset, and I'm also going to turn on the LWZX graphics pack. Since I am using an AMD GPU right now, I'm going to be selecting to use the AMD and Intel shadow fixes. In the event that you are using an Intel or Nvidia iGPU, make sure to turn on the specific graphics options for any of those GPUs. Next, we're also going to be turning on the no depth of field graphics pack since it gives a small bit better performance in combat, and we're also going to be activating clarity. I wouldn't advise turning on LOD, BIOS, or Enhanced Reflections, as it can actually drop your performance in-game. Next, we're also going to be editing our game profile, and as I already set up previous in the video, I am using a triple core recompiler and threaded quantum of 100,000. You can enable or disable this extended texture readback, it really doesn't matter since it's auto-enabled in CMU itself, 
and then you simply want to copy the remainder of the settings you've seen displayed on screen. Obviously, before you can play any game properly, you're going to need to map your inputs, so come to Options, Input Settings, and then you want to make sure you're emulating the Wii U gamepad. Next, you're going to want to select whichever controller API you're using. I'm using a direct input with my DualShock 4 controller, so I select this controller. Then I simply proceed to map any and all of these buttons. Once you have the button maps applied, you're going to be required to enter a profile name, just call it controller1 or something similar, then hit save and this controller profile is going to be saved for utilization in future. Now the controllers are set up, we're going to come back to options and set up some general settings. In this first window, I like to select these two options to remember main and secondary window position. I also like to disable a discord rich presence. Coming across to the graphics tab, you're going to be leaving it at OpenGL since that's the only API we have right now and you're also going to be disabling full sync at GX2 draw done. For upscale and downscale filter, you're going to be leaving both of these at bilinear and for a frame rate overlay, I'm just going to set this to a value in the top left hand corner of my window so that we can see exactly what our performance is like especially so now that we're using the AMD GPU on Linux. Next, coming to the audio tab, you want to set this to X Audio 2, and in the event that you get stuttery or a broken crackling audio, you want to raise your latency. Since I don't get crackling audio, I'm going to leave mine at 24 milliseconds. Next, you want to set both your TV and gamepad device audio to your primary sound driver, and then you want to make sure that you actually turn the volume up. Since none of the games I play use the gamepad audio device, I'm simply going to leave it the same. Disabled. Next, if you have dumped your files from your Wii U in order to use the online mode with CMU emulator, you can simply activate your account right here, and that is pretty much all of the settings we require in general. Next up, we have a few more compatibility settings. For example, in CPU mode, you want to make sure this is set to single core recompiler, and Affinity, you want this set to all logical cores. Next, you want to come across to your debug tab, under custom timer, set this to QPC at 1x speed, then MM timer accuracy to 1 millisecond. Again, make sure you have custom timer of QPC at 1x speed and MM timer of 1 millisecond. Again, I would highly advise you to use use CMUHook H.264 in order to have proper H.264 video playback in games like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So once you have all of these settings properly applied, we are now ready to launch the game for the first time and see what our performance is like with AMD on Linux. Okay, so there we go, we're now loaded in the game and you can see my performance metrics in the top left hand corner. Be aware that as always when you load into game and you don't have a shader cache built, you are going to get very, very stuttery gameplay just like this. That is until you start to build your shader cache, then your game will become much, much smoother like you can see is happening in mine right now. Performance wise, after our cache has been built, we are running anywhere between around 48 to 60 frames per second, which I can tell you is roughly about 2.5 times the performance you could expect if you were running this exact same hardware on the Windows operating system. And congratulations, you are now running The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild to the best of its possible potential using your AMD GPU on Ubuntu 19.04. Next up, we're going to be taking a look at Yuzu Emulator, an emulator for the Nintendo Switch, and I'm going to be showing you the best possible settings for both Intel and AMD GPUs on Linux. As we've done already, we're going to be coming back to our guides folder where you're going to be opening up Yuzu with Ubuntu 19.04. As with the installation process for CMU emulator and everything we've done thus far, all you need to do is right click your desktop, open a terminal and then enter all of these commands one after the other. These commands are going to download and install all of the dependencies for both building and using Yuzu on the Linux operating system. As I said, simply follow absolutely everything it says on screen. Thankfully, setting up Yuzu on Ubuntu 19.04 is a lot easier than CMU. For this final installation command, it is probably already going to be installed in Ubuntu 19.04 by the time you install it. It was for me, but please just run this command in the event that it isn't. As you can see, when I run it once, then run it one more time, it is going to tell me that this file already exists, which means that it is already downloaded and installed on our operating system. Next you need to download your latest Yuzu Canary version. To do this, simply open your browser and navigate over to the Yuzu emulator website. Once here, you're looking for this download page, then when you scroll down the page, you're looking for this latest Canary version right here. All you need to do is click this Linux item here and it will begin downloading your latest Yuzu Canary version. I'm simply going to click select file and click OK. 
In the top right hand corner you'll see this little uh, blue uh, downward facing arrow. Simply click this folder icon and this will bring you to the directory where this file has downloaded. Next, right click it and select extract here. Then once this file has extracted, simply right click it, select cut and then we're going to be pasting this file and folder to our desktop right here. Once you have your Yuzu Canary folder, simply open it and you should see these four files inside it like so. Next, all you have to do is, as with CMU Emulator, right click and open a new terminal in this window. And depending on which GPU, be it AMD, Intel or Nvidia, you're going to be entering your select command for your specific GPU. Again, since I currently have an AMD GPU in my system, I use the AMD one, and since I do not have my prod.keys or any of my game directories set up, this is exactly what's going to show on screen. Next, you want to click Open Yuzu Folder, and it is into this directory right here that you need to right-click, create a new folder, and call this folder Keys. It's into this keys folder that you want to put your prod.keys file. This prod.keys file is required for the running and decrypting of games on Yuzu emulator. If you already have this on your Windows installation, simply come to your Windows OS drive, come to users, your username, then come to app data, roaming, scroll down till you find the Yuzu folder, Next, into your keys folder, and right here is where you'll find your prod.keys file. All you need to do is right click, copy, and then paste this prod.keys file into your newly created Yuzu folder within your Linux Yuzu directory. Having this file in this directory is going to allow you to boot and play encrypted games on this Nintendo Switch emulator. Once you have this keys file, you are going to be required to once again boot, so again, open in terminal, again, copy and paste the running command for your specific GPU into this terminal window and hit enter. And there we go! Unlike the last time we booted it, we no longer get the pop-up that's telling us we are missing our derivation or keys component. Next, you're going to want to select your game directory. Again, I'm going to be using my Windows file directories, so I'm going to be coming to my largest storage medium on which I store my Nintendo Switch dumped games. Come to this folder, I'm going to be coming to my Switch stuff folder, and my Switch games are stored right here. Basically, all that I need to do is select my Switch games folder in which my games are stored and click open. Hit open and if I wait a few moments, all of my games should appear in the games list. And there you go, you can see that they are all now properly showing up. Personally, what I like to do is I like to come to emulation, configure, then come to this general games list section and for row 2 I just set this to title name so that when my games appear it only shows their name and not their title ID. Personally, I think it just looks a lot tidier. Now, for games like Pokemon Let's Go, they require certain configurations in order to work, and also, unfortunately, at the time of making this video, such games like Super Mario Odyssey unfortunately do not work on Linux when using this Mesa driver. They do boot, and they do have a very good performance. Unfortunately, though, after a few minutes in gameplay, it's just going to completely softlock your operating system. For games like Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, you are required to use certain settings. For example, you want to use OpenGL compatibility profile, you want to use Use Disk Shader Cache, and for Pokemon Let's Go, and any other games that are 30 frames per second on the Nintendo Switch, you want to force 30 frames per second mode. You also need to come to Controls, I'm going to set this to Custom, and then I'm going to open this Configure window. For games like Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee, you are required to only use this Joy-Cons docked controller, so make sure that you only have the Joy-Cons docked controller on. For this preliminary setup though, we are going to be mapping this Player 1 controller to the Pro controller and then setting up all of our button maps. It's really as easy as just following exactly what it says on screen. Literally, that's all you have to do, simply do exactly what the emulator asks of you. If you're having any confusion as to exactly what buttons you should be mapping, I would highly advise that you look up the layout of a Nintendo Switch Pro Controller and simply copy that. There is one small nuance that you need to make sure of for this ZL button and the ZR button. You need to make sure that both of these are mapped to positive, not negative values. If they are set to negative values, they will not fully work in every game. Once you have any and all of your button maps set up, simply click the OK button in the bottom right hand corner. Now, as I said, for Pokemon Let's Go, you are required to use this Joy-Cons docked controller. So again, simply select this and then you are going to be required to hit the configure button and as you did for the previous pro controller, simply map all your buttons. Once all the buttons are mapped, make sure to hit OK, then OK again and you are now done with controller setup. 
In order to have Pokemon a Let's Go Pikachu or Eevee properly work, you are required to add a game save. To add this save file, simply right click, open save data location, then you'll be selecting your Yuzu user profile. Doing this will open up your save directory for this specific game. Once you do this and open up this folder, this is exactly where you're going to be pasting the save file for your own specific game. You'll find this save file for Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu or Eevee down in the description of this video. So once you have your save file added to your game and your controller is set to the docked Joy-Cons controller, you are now ready to boot into your game with working graphics, working shadows and working fonts on your AMD GPU on Linux. Jumping forward into some outer world gameplay, you can see that I am perfectly locked to 30 frames per second with fully rendered graphics and I will also have fully and properly rendered fonts, now allowing this game to be playable with an AMD GPU. Now that we've covered AMD GPUs and Yuzu on Linux, let's jump across and take a look at the Nvidia GPU side of things. Okay, so now that I've rebooted and replaced my RX 580 with my 1080 Ti, you can see I am in fact using the 1080 Ti in my details tab which shows my system configuration. Now in the event that you installed Ubuntu with the Nvidia GPU already installed, and if you followed all of the instructions that I showed for installation, you should be given this option to download and install all of these different options in the software updater for Ubuntu. As usual, it is pretty good practice to simply download and install install any new updates as they become available to you, so please make sure to have everything as up to date as you possibly can. Once you have everything up to date, you simply click OK and you next need to reopen your software updater window. Again, simply search for soft, open software updater and when this window pops up, you're simply going to be clicking the settings button on the left. Once settings opens, you're going to be coming to additional drivers and as long as you see this right here, it means you are using the correct driver for your Nvidia GPU. Now in the guides I provided you with, there are instructions on downloading and installing the very latest most up to date Nvidia driver. As you see when I open it, it's as easy as anything else I've shown in this guide, all you have to do is follow the instructions and do exactly what the text document states. You can see in the guide it tells you to switch to the new driver, the driver which that is talking about is this one at the bottom right here. If you are installing the latest Nvidia driver, please make sure to swap to this driver, then reboot, and then follow the text document entering all of the commands as you have done before. To be honest, as long as you are using the 418 version driver you can see in my software updating tool, you realistically do not need to update to the 430 driver as it has pretty much no performance or usability differences between either of the drivers. Again, for launching Yuzu, it really is as easy as anything I've shown this far. All you have to do is open a terminal, then go to your guides, go to the Yuzu with Ubuntu guide and then find the command for launching with an Nvidia GPU. This is the command right here, all you have to do is highlight it, copy it and then paste all of this data into this window right here and hit enter. Again, you need to make sure that your prod.keys file is in your keys folder within the Yuzu directory and as well as that once you have your game paths set up like I've previously showed you, all of your games should appear like this. Unlike with AMD GPUs and using the Mesa driver, Nvidia GPUs when using the Nvidia proprietary driver are able to play and boot Super Mario Odyssey and it has in fact very very good performance, even better than on the Windows operating system. For Super Mario Odyssey, you are going to want to use all the settings shown on screen now, and unlike Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee, Super Mario Odyssey does not require a game save to go in game. And there we go, I am now loaded into Cap Kingdom in the Super Mario Odyssey on a Linux using my Nvidia GPU, and as you can see, my performance is very, very good, pretty much staying over 50 or 55 frames per second at all times. Again, as with other games on this emulator, and similarly to Simu emulator, you are going to have to fully build your shader cache in order to have the best possible performance and stability in gameplay, so literally all you have to do is simply play your games and your shader caches will naturally build. So there you go guys, a full and complete installation and setup guide for a Linux in using CMU and Yuzu emulator. Hopefully everything I've shown in this video has given you the best possible performance that you can expect when using this operating system and your hardware. Once again guys, cheers for checking out the video, remember to like it if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, and as always, subscribe to the channel if you want to see all future videos from me.